Eu sou vice-cacique. This song says that we had our forest where there has been a lot of fruit to live on, and now increasingly we're losing the fruit trees in the forest. So we're holding rituals in order to restore, for the spirit to help restore the forest. We take our pipes with us to smoke the pipes. We talk to the forest, the spirit of the forest, because that's in the middle of nature, you have to respect nature. It, I always go to the beach or to the waterfalls. I don't, I sit next to the waterfalls, sit on the rock and talk to the forest and the waterfall. And then I dive after that because with the healer, the medicine man says that the waterfall is good for you. The waterfall takes all the bad spirits away from you. It flows into the waterfall and the river takes it into the sea and you're free of the bad vibes. The song talks about nature, be birds and the sea, each, the lyrics, each song has its lyrics and a translation. The melody, the music, there's always some melody talking about others in the nature, but uh, one is different from the other. I got here to the village when I was eight years old. Now I'm four years old. I just started in September, 40 years old. And from eight to 40 years. Who's good at math? It's 32 years. I've been living here for 32 years, in other words. Guitar. It's a six chord guitar, but we play it with five. It's a tune to the choir. And we have drums as well and rattles. When we talk about music, it's important for us in the village in the village and outside the village as well. In the village, we share knowledge and respect for culture, respecting nature and respecting the spirit, the spiritual force of, the, of nature. Ministério do Turismo. The Ministry of Tourism and the Casa Azul Association proudly present the 19th Flip, Parachi International Literary Festival.
a project benefiting from a federal law for cultural incentives and Vadi Cultural Institute with the official sponsorship by Itau, Itau Bank and the Vadi Cultural Institute. The event is organized by the Casa Azul Association, the Special Secretary for Culture under the Ministry of Tourism of the Brazilian Federal Government. Nyeri Gera is in Guarani means where the spirits bathe or the name for the Atlantic forest in Guarani. Migrant botanies, plant politics, vegetalize, trans forest, act one. Here the green in search of the late afternoon, metamorphosis, cartographies to delay the end of the world. This roundtable is live broadcast in three channels on internet, audio, Portuguese, and English. Please choose the language of your preference in the lower right-hand toolbar. You can send questions in throughout the broadcast through the YouTube chat box. At the end of the meeting, some of these questions will be addressed to the authors. Hello, welcome one and all. Welcome one and all to the last day of FLIP, the 19th Parachi International Literary Festival. It's a day that everybody's tired in this round table is a celebration. It's a round table for us to reflect on how things end so well based on a perspective, a plant and botanical perspective in the 19th FLIP are we pay tribute to authors usually but in this specific flip we're paying tribute to the forest which is Nyeri, where the spirits bathe and bearing witness to and telling stories over the course of these times preceding our own existence this is the forest this forest the forest telling its own story forest's world in a non-normative, non-literary way, and according to what we conceive of as literature, but when we can think of literature, the literature of the forest together here, all of us, which is writing done with animals, fungi, plants, other beings, in which gives us new clues of what we might be able to uh, produce collectively at a moment like this. This edition of Flip, Flip is a literary festival. So we also celebrate not only this round table, but throughout Flip, it's a party. In, in this case, it's also at home. People are participating from home. We see our heads floating on the computer screens and trying to have this happen in a, as healthily as possible given the uh, pandemic that's assaulting the entire world and more than 600,000 Brazilians have died from COVID-19. We can never forget this tragedy. We had this mission to stitch together a conversation between two people whom I admire greatly, Emmanuel Cocha, the philosopher, and Adriana Calcanhoto, the singer and composer from Brazil. I want to thank the curatorial forest that promoted this meeting with such a great sensitivity it also gave me the mission of participating in this round table specifically i want to thank everyone involved the producers the interpreters and everyone who's here attending as well in a word let's get started straight away i want to introduce adriana calcaiot is here with me adriana calcaiot needs no introduction for the brazilians she Every Brazilians have heard her. She has more than 19 albums. She's a singer, composer, and, and uh, entertainer, an instrumental musician, arranger, writer, and illustrator. In addition to teaching at the University of Coimbra in Portugal, she is a gaúcha. She's the daughter of a drummer and a ballerina 
who chose Rio to live in uh, Rio, and her mother probably doesn't like uh, red stoplights. Woman, uh, Brazil would, is, this is the result of an artistic residence at the University of Coimbra, discussing her work called Woman Brazil Wood, and with me as well, some side, I don't know, left, right, center, is Emanuele Cocha. Emanuele Cocha is an Italian philosopher. He's from a small town in Northern Italy. I can't remember exactly. And Colette is Geminiano. a philosopher and Gemini and teaches uh, social science in Paris, where he lives currently. He began to study agronomy before he switched to philosophy in medieval philosophy for the University of Florence. He was a professor at Freiburg, an enthusiast of botany and author in Brazil of uh, the uh, life of plants. Uh, both uh, the other book and both of these books and Metamorphoses published by Dungeons Publishing House here in Brazil. 2019, he collaborated with an exhibit in Les Arbres at art, contemporary art and with Brazilian artists like Claudia Andrews, uh, Wilson Pimenta, Miguel Wilson Tosha, Adriana Vadre, and Zebini was also mentioned. And when Mancoso was in the, when uh, Stefano Mancuso cited the Zebini, the Brazilian painter and artist. Welcome, good afternoon to both of you. I'll let you introduce yourself and thanks before I ask the first question for Emanuele Cocha. And Adriana, if you'd like to ask a question or make introductory comments. Your microphone is muted, Adriana. Sorry, good afternoon. It's a huge pleasure to be here. It's a huge joy to meet a man via uma coisa, via I, uh, technology, internet. But um, I'd love to talk to him. I'm anxious to talk. I feel affinity. I'm here in my studio, in the studio in the forest, but I have attended the roundtables of FLIP in as many as I've been able to. And it's so similar to what I'm experiencing here in the forest and the things that he says, that I think that we'll have a great conversation here this afternoon. Emmanuel, can you tell us a few things? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Emmanuel Koch. I'm very honored to talk with Adriana, who's a mythological character for me to a certain extent, more mythological and real. Very happy to meet friends again, Brazilian friends, Cecilia, Ana, Hermano, Cecilia, Luis, who became a great friend. I'm extremely happy to be here, even though remotely via internet, but coming back to a country which I love and I feel closely connected to, Brazil. Thank you, Adriana and Emanuele. I have a mission, and also a mission, cosmological mission to ask several questions and to have you converse and also based on a theme which is the issue of finitude and based on the book by The Life of Plants, which I had, I read in 2017, a philosopher, Adriana Faust, who recommended this book, had this first question for you. So let's go. The Life of Plants, A Metaphysics of Mixture is a book which changed your life. I don't know. It's a question. I imagine so, at least in Brazil, you are seen through this book and it's a book which you dedicated to your twin brother, Mateo. You say that the idea of this book reached you during a visit to the temple Fushimi in Nari, Kyoto in March 2009. In your book, you say, quote, it was with him and by him that I began to breathe for the first time, unquote, concerning your twin brother, Mateo. We're here in this flip, thinking of Nieri, the spirit of the forest, the Atlantic forest. We call this place the forest, but which is also the place where this spirits bathe. Your twin brother, Mateo, you also not only learned to breathe, but you sprouted together, shared the same placenta, the same amniotic fluid, bathed 
by the waters of your mother's body. Today, like Susana, Adriana's partner, Mateo is cosmic dust, and all of us will be. Nevertheless, you are a participant in the Colette's life, your daughter. At some level, how do you think that your relationship to the plants is connected to the ways when your brother left you and uh, forever and your daughter was born? What a beautiful question. Thank you. I'm going to try to answer at the same level. You had promised not to ask tricky questions. It's a beautiful question, but it's very tricky. You are correct. Actually, I have a strong bond, but it's not a bond only with the disappearance and death. I don't know if people disappear. They die, but they don't actually disappear. Life never disappears. The person dies, but die doesn't just means changing the form of presence. A witness, but we don't even need to ask ourselves material where the person is. I believe that the experience of any of us of never stopping to speak with the dead every day, all the time. There is a beautiful book by Vincent Desprez, which attempts to baptize or name this presence, this verbal mental presence of people who have died but have not disappeared. And the problem of death, this is impossibility precisely. The problem in recourse to death, it's difficult to de deal with being born. In addition to dying, I believe that there is a very strong bond in everything that I did, but especially with the book, The Life of Plants, and the metaphysics of mixtures, the issue of twinship, and the issue of fatherhood as well. Twinship and fatherhood, I think that all of us are twins, all living beings. To live is an uh, experience of cosmic twinship, uh, so that for material reasons, each living being is called on to acknowledge in the other living beings their twin. Uh, being born means that we forget, but in, every time we are born, every living being that is born is a twin of the mother and the father, twins simultaneously for two people genetically. But precisely, we don't realize this. We don't want to know about it. Or we react poorly to this possibility, this proximity, this not only with our parents, because our parents are twins and other beings, which in turn also, and so on, back to the origin of life. Each living being, therefore, has a relationship of twinship, which is more or less strong with other living being and the beings. And the only way to found an ethnic or morale is to acknowledge that all of us are twins and that the difference in appearance is a difference uh, like in twins. One has the hair is somewhat darker brown, the other is somewhat blonder, but this doesn't change the the fact that they are flesh of the same flesh. I believe that this is the only way of reaching a real form, a real form, not only abstract form, a sensitive emotional form of fe a feeling of belonging to life. And I believe that we should stop thinking in living beings based on species, because the idea of species is also a way of making this multiplicity of life and building hierarchies, this multiplicity, turn this into something that puts a distance towards things. But I think we should can see the difference between a woman, a, a man, and a squirrel, a pine tree, and a fungus. 
as a, a incidental difference. If there is, if, it, if there should be suppressed almost increasingly in our relationship to any other living being, we should seek evidence of this similarity, which does not mean love immediately, of course, because the relationship with the twin is complicated as well. But it means immediate awareness of being the same life, the same thing. And therefore, neither the two should prevail and that it's necessary to find an agreement of form of a way of living together. Thank you, Emmanuel. It is a question, but also for you to talk a little bit. And thank you for receiving the question. Adriana, a little bit along the same line, in the same tone. I was doing my homework here, and I found concerning the, the afternoon, the song, this kind of praise. Just imagine like a marriage scene, everything. The afternoon, my love waters the plants. It's a kind of looping, a continuous looping of the continuum of life. And this looping where my love always in watering the plants, I've da vida a duas, que se confirma também pelos ares. Lived with two. Bicicleta, the, air, the bicycle, plants, sky, the bookshelves, book, everything will soon be in place. I would like to ask you, to what extent do plants have they played, bared witness to this life? And how, to what extent were, were they co-authors of the daily narrative of you and when your love left? that uh, watered the plants. How can you continue watering these plants? And what changes in the intensive relationship between Adriana and the plants? This, the plants, the ones that came, the ones that will come, are the ones that are there. After this experience of finitude. And now I'm going to stop talking after Emanuele. It's something else. Yeah. É, Susana era jardineira. Susana was a gardener, first and foremost. My partner, people said Susana is a filmmaker. She introduced herself as a filmmaker, but she introduced herself as a gardener, especially for people who didn't understand assim, o que quite ela well what she was doing era and who she was in some circumstances and some asked, What do you do? She said, I'm a gardener. So, so the plants, cinco anos que eu vivi com ela, muito presentes no sentido de, se você quisesse encontrar a Susana, é só seguir, que na ponta da mangueira ela estava lá regando as plantas. The hose should be there watering the plants, as the song says. As we used to live in Ipanema, and I realized that in Ipanema, in the afternoon, the Depois o Cazuza, assim, Drummond, Drummond, e era... Following Drummond, it was sundown on Ipanema Beach in the late afternoon, and she watered the plants while I was thinking and composing that song. It's just something that I think has a lot to do with what Emanuele says, that ela tinha uma hierarquia, she a... e ela falava isso, ela falava she talked, com os cachorros, she com os gatos também, mas mais... Era mais dos cachorros. Mesmo assim, preferindo os cachorros. E às vezes eu ouvia. Às vezes eu ouvia. First, it's the plants, then animals, dogs, and way down at the bottom is humanity. But you can't pull out and yank the plants out of the garden, she used to say to the dog. In other words, she was right, right? She still is. <laughs> OK, what I was going to comment here, I had commented at the beginning of our meeting here that there are these concepts, these practical principles of 
agroforestry or biodiversity, which I learned with my uh, Alini Portugal, which is entropy management strata and consortium. So I got these concepts of forestry to pitch into the conversation. I'm going to introduce a common phyto disturbance for us to change the direction of the conversation. So we're going to go back to Adrian again, rather than, than change the order. Adrian, do you have a relationship to mate, this mate tea? If you take mate tea, what happens to you when you see someone drinking shimahau, the mate, mate tea, if this is foundational, as in everybody from the or Uruguay, is because it is a drink. It's a collective drink. I have friends who have mate tea and drink them at home. But the idea is to share. Pass the gourd around. It's difficult with the pandemic. It changed somewhat with the pandemic because you can't drink the mate tea. It's too. It keeps me too wired. I recorded a disc at the beginning of my career. The hours, possible hours in the studio were in the wee hours of the morning. It was the time when there was no stars. That was the time we could use the studio, the recording studio, in order to make a disc. We drank mate tea from beginning to end. Myself, as a gaucha, and other people who are not from, they're not gauchos, but it's foundational. This plant is in the life of anybody who's a gaucho. It's also like a companion. And and the re research on mate tea based on your gaucho, gaucho heritage, the person that introduced the mate tea were the Guarani tea uh, Indians who inhabited the banks of the Paraná River, something else that connects the spirit of the forest, not only to this round table, but also to this Brazilian, uh, Brazilian roots and foundations just a conversation with indigenous peoples and the traditional peoples and First Nations. Emmanuel, I'm going to give you, I have a questions here about your favorite plants that people sent me in the chat box, but I'd like you to talk about two specific plants, garlic and um, rosemary. With garlic, I have a complicated relationship with garlic because I can't eat too much garlic. But rosemary, my relationship to rosemary is almost mystical. What I always thought is that precisely in these days, I was thinking more about something that is more evident still because I have stomach problems and I have to be careful with what I eat. Actually, should stop classifying plants as a psychotropic and normal plants. All plants are psychoactive or psychotropic in different intensities. They're all psychoactive. In other words, all these plants, in addition to having a taste or flavor, which per se is the minimal level of psychoactivity and sensitive journeys into other universes, but all plants are defined, are capable of producing a vision, a state, a modified sensitive state. So this means that actually our relationship to plants is at any rate a quote unquote drugged relationship or made of a shamanic, a shamanistic journey, even in the utilitarian sense, like that in Europe, we say you drink tea and coffee. We ask the plants to produce visions, energy, different flavors. And I say this because we forget how much psychological force the plants have and how our psychological life depends on plants. And this is something fascinating in two senses. First, because in the end of the day, perhaps we should rethink our categorization of plants. 
for example, rewrite uh, plant cartography based on the typical effects induced by plants in us. So classify plants based on the ones that give us energy, the ones that give us that make us calm. It would be interesting to do uh, a psychoactive map of the plant world on the one hand. On the other hand, taking seriously the fact that plants actually live or spend much energy producing a spectacle for animals because what they do is actually that. One thing is what Stefano Mancuso is working on now. Stefano Mancuso, we don't value the fact that there exist beings, plants, which spend energy, sugar, time to produce uh, parts of their body which are going to be consumed. They offer this to kind of cannibalism and this act of this cannibalism produces, it's not exactly an exchange of energy, but it's an exchange of visions to eat an apple, for example, is not only energy, it's living a moment of sweetness and infinite sweetness. And so to assume as something serious, to take it seriously, this issue that plants produce this vision, this effect on us, it always happens through this. They have us as hostages in a certain sense. A relationship to coffee, tea, fruits. So we should rethink based on this generalization and this acceptance of our re psychoactive relationship to plants. The fact that the relationship between species oftentimes is a psychological relationship of enchantment, fetish, almost being fooled. Of, uh, we are dazzled by the plants. They play with us. This fact should be taken very seriously, I believe. And it should become the basis for a new form of naming plants, of naming our relationship to plants. And in fact, if I want to think of the names that you gave to garlic and rosemary, the two images that appear are or towards, for several different reasons, towards, and for garlic and rosemary, I think it's delicious. So plants bewitch us. That's what the plants do, bewitching us, taking seriously that they're not illusions. They are what the plants want and have decided to produce in all animals. So that there's this relationship of almost psychological possession by plants. I'm talking about a, a context I thought that Ayutas, but in Europe, for Ayuto Karanaka, it's normal, but that's not taken seriously in Europe. And that's not taken for granted. We have to take this seriously and rethink everything based on this strange psychological magic produced by plants and to release and liberalize and perceive and say that all plants are drugs. There's no plants which are not. Garlic is also a drug and rosemary and coffee, of course. I ask myself and wonder based on this perspective, this psychoactive perspective, this psychoactive map that you're considering making, what are uh, we, what is psycho, what are psychoactive for the plants, for them? I'd like to open up now for the microphone to Adriana. I have several different questions, but I, I should not monopolize the debate with my own questions. So I'd like to open up for Adriana to see if she wants to ask specific questions for Emanuele based on her reading of the life of plants in this conversation itself, which has been long awaited here. I'd like to ask him the following, if we, any being 
needs to breathe if it's uh, to being being a being is to breathe you have to have photosynthesis and you need plants since this is so obvious why isn't it that obvious why don't we act like that i came to the studio here i'm in the forest here and i have an app here which is the time that asked me to drink water and i'm in the forest and i have to have an app in order to remember to drink water and i was configuring my telephone and i had to say for the to the machine i am a human because the machine doesn't know how to recognize another machine there's a mismatch there that comes from this ignorance that people have people want to be ignorant you talk about this issue of species and i think to myself humanity the close to a species is uh is a, a parasitic it kills the host okay so and it's incredible because people don't learn that we know that but we don't learn we don't we have in brazil it's called mistletoe they have the minister of the environment who is a smuggler of fine hardwoods which is so complex i would like to hear from you why do we persist with this kind of attitude with regard to plants Thank you very much. Okay, fine. We persist in this kind of attitude first because there was an attempt for centuries, almost leaving aside plants' existence. There's several different reasons. First, because we are animals. And it's easier perhaps to relate to animals than to plants. It's easier to project ourselves and to identify with animals than with plants. And in addition, it's if the human species having left the forest, that the humankind celebrates independence from plant life. And the forest, almost like a teenager, celebrates independence from his or her parents celebrating wow i'm free i'm independent and i my own boss it's a, more of a crisis of adolescence i would say in humankind that we're overcoming now because actually i believe that there are several different signs indicating that this forget forgetting this oblivion secular forgetfulness is passing there's signs that we all identify i can measure for example how the world is different compared to the time in which i was in the university and agronomy when i was very young i was studying agronomy you were socially excluded if you loved plants that meant to be weird to be a nerd i could tell you a lot of stories about that but this when i was studying agronomy it was like you'd become an outcast if you said you loved plants. When I was young to serve in the army, I had to do a number of physical, clinical, and psychological tests. In the psychological tests, there was a question, do you like flowers? And I said, yes. And they sent me to talk to a psychologist because they thought that I wasn't a normal person because I loved flowers. So we've gone from this situation, this stage, to a time in which today, at least superficially, we can say that there is great attention to plants. So I believe that this is a change, a major change, the fact that there are people like Stefano Mancuso, there, who have bestsellers on plants selling uh, dozen, millions of copies, and this is proof that the change has already happened. The change happened as well because we already accept that plants think, that plants have a consciousness that they communicate. So I think that the question now that we should concentrate on is what we want to do with these new friends. They've been excluded, and now, they've again, 
been accepted to the group as citizens of the world, but it's difficult now to imagine a possible relationship with them, given that they've been excluded for centuries. I think this is the most important question. How, for example, are we going to build our cities? How are we going to interweave our life with the life of plants in a different way? It's much more difficult to imagine this than ask oneself why for centuries they were excluded. It's somewhat like in the relations, it's much more difficult to understand how to begin a relationship with someone rather than asking oneself why a certain relationship did not work. So I believe that the main question today, the big question is this. It's a question which artists like you or like Luis and Nesto Neto, all of the great Brazilian artists who have a privileged relationship to the forest for physical proximity in Europe, the forests are rare after all. So the question is, that you, uh, above, first and foremost, can answer. Because the question is how we want to live with these new friends, the plants. It's a more aesthetic than moral question. The question is not what we have to do or what we should do, but is the amount of pleasure that we want to exchange with the plants. And the great experts of sensitive pleasure are artists, right, at the end of the day. So I believe that ecology has to be taken as hostage yeah, to transform into a question which artists are going to take charge of because we need to reintroduce, we need to go from a moral moment, which was important, of course, where we asked ourselves about guilt. The issue is guilt. Why did we let certain things happen? Why didn't we do other things? And now the awareness has happened. And the question for our consciousness is which pleasures, which desires we want to interweave with li the life of plants and animals. It's a very difficult question because the questions about desire and pleasure are the most difficult ones in the human beings' lives. And they're the questions that normally artists are the ones that help us to answer. And the psychoanalysts as well. Psychoanalysts go back to guilt again. They focus oftentimes on guilt. Father, mother, but in this case, not. Father and mother, dead already. So the issue is how do we interweave new relations of pleasure or sex, erotic pleasures or sexual pleasure with plants and animals, all animals and plants with which we want to relate. Beth Stephens with the echo sexual experience, how you transform the, how to fall in love with earth in also an erotic way. But it has to do with the question that I was going to ask for Adriana, which concerns the project in Parachi of creating a musical studio in the forest in Yeri, in the Atlantic Forest in Parachi, if you're considering composing not only amongst the plants, surrounded by them, but with the plants as well. And how do you think it would be possible to do music based on and with plants or with the forest? And how has it been to establish this relationship, this musical relationship, poetic relationship, and communal relationship? I thought you were beginning of a project of building this studio. Are you building this studio How's this experience playing out? And what plans do you have for this musical studio in the forest in Parachi and composing with the forest as well? I love the forest. I live in the forest. I live in the forest. And 
So to be able to record in the forest is amazing because music is permeable to the environment, the surroundings. The surroundings is, Manuel says, it's the environment. And the difference, I think, in recording a disc in a studio in Copacabana, for example, and in a studio in the middle of the forest, it's amazing, the difference. It's huge, this exchange, the way that we record, and all of this leaves its mark on the music. And I think that in Parachi, it's a place which has a, a lot of oral culture to be recorded. So I wanted to do basically, I'm in this studio here, which is in the middle of the forest. And in other words, it changes the beats and the tempos, uh, the internal rhythm of us as individuals in the group here working. It changes everything. It's something entirely different. But now I'd like to pick up on and ask a question for Emanuele, which is the following. You said, now that we understood that the plants have a consciousness, you say this phrase that you're there. We here in Brazil don't have this certainty, this consciousness or awareness. Do you think that we finally understood that plants have a consciousness? Do you think that it's because they communicate? Do you think it's because we understand because there's communication, so there's intelligence? In the sense that we own it now believe since they communicate, plants communicate, they are have uh, conscious beings. Okay, two things, or, or rather three. We know that plants think and communicate first based on a based on what botanists like Stefano Mancuso and others have done. In other words, they proved scientifically that plants are conscious, they know perfectly what is happening outside of them, what happens inside them, and the difference between the inside and outside, plants communicate. And what is even more important in this discovery is the evidence that from the scientific point of view, finally, it's been accepted that there doesn't have to be a brain in order for a living being to think and communicate. This was precisely part of the zoological autism of Homo sapiens, the fact that humans always thought of thinking based on the anatomical structure and based on the presence of the brain. They asked how beings think, and they always asked animals to demonstrate what it meant to think. The experiments with mice, for example, putting mice inside a maze to understand how they function. And it was an experiment based on the assumption that it was necessary to be similar to us to have a brain to think. Today, finally, science understood and botany and biologists understood, no, you don't have to be a brain, have to have a brain to think. Suffice it to live and to live and think, to live and communicate are synonyms. Living beings have to think to know what they are, what the world is, and they have to know who is next to them and communicate in some way. And this, from the scientific point of view, an imaginative way opens up great perspectives. We no longer need to ask ourselves who thinks and who doesn't think, but how beings think based on the body. Because what it means to think, to think is like to live. If you have leaves rather than arms, what does it mean to think? If you are a mollusk or a clam, what does it mean if you're a clam or if you're fungus or mushroom? So today, the issue of thinking and communication has to be in the other way around. Every living being allows thinking to exist differently based on the body that that living being has. So this is a fundamental point, which so far 
pertains only to science, but little by little disseminates, as is normal at the beginning. Any idea at the beginning belongs to a small group of people and then expands, but it's something so overwhelming. It's something that opens up to a rela possible relationship so new with any living beings. Why does it open up such a new relationship? Because once we accept that each living being thinks and speaks the relationship that we have to dogs, cats, fungi, rats, trees, and everything is the same relationship that an anthropologist or ethnologist has with a different culture that they are unfamiliar with. They don't understand the language, for example. An ethnologist or anthropologist, in reality, the science of living beings is anthropology science of other uh, cultures, all of other cultures, which have different languages, which we don't know, but let's go and observe, and we don't know quite well, we don't know the language, but we know that they have a language. So to study animals means to be an anthropologist of cultures that are still unknown to us. And this is very beautiful because it means that we are in a universe of cultures which we still we still need to learn and this is beautiful because art plays a fundamental role in this process because if everyone everyone speaks we already know for example dolphins speak for example we know that they call each other by their name so the word is not connected only to a function or a biological, primary biological requirement. It also is an expression, a useless expression. So there is also a, a huge space opening up for observation of a series of expressions that are non-functional in living beings or art of the other, which is huge. And based on this point of view, which I mentioned that plants produce substances, psychoactive substances always. So this is also a way of communicating, a non-functional way of communicating, not necessarily. Emmanuel, there's this maxim or saying that it's a joke, they say, or not, that philosophers have their heads cut off the head thinking about what you just said. You don't have the brain to think you believe that in the history of philosophy, one of the main problems that we have was the fact that philosophers don't think with the body or through the body. I don't know if you agree with that either. No, the problem is that philosophy thought only with the human body, only with the brain. Philosophy would, be, would have to be able to think with the body of others. At the end of the day, that's the point. When you take a strong drug or even coffee, it means to think with the other's body or mate tea that you were discussing. So the problem is not body or non-body. The problem is the hierarchy of bodies. What Adriana said, the hierarchy we have animals above everything else oh, without considering that actually everything everyone thinks what i was saying is this all the influences psychoactive influences or forms of specific communication the plants are teachers of flower between a plant and a bee but these substances as well caffeine and sugar, the sugar from apples, for example, are communications between species or between kingdoms, even the plant kingdom and the animal kingdom, and we have to name it this way. They are way, forms of communication which give us pleasure, but as a caress between animals gives pleasure, the same thing. The same thing that we should simply find a new name for it. 
They are phenomena that already exist. They aren't new, but which need other names. I don't know if I answered your question, Adriana. You did much more than my question. It's wonderful. You have the floor, Adriana. Take it away. Okay. I like to, in this that you just mentioned, tell us a little bit more about this, the art of the other. Yes, actually, almost everything that we see is art. There's a book just published a few years ago, written by the ornithologist from Yale, Richard Plum, from Yale, ornithologist from Yale, who picked up on a debate which Darwin had launched the second major book that he wrote, which was the origin of the species, rather, uh, after the origin of the species, the second book by Darwin, where he posed the problem that oftentimes in bird evolution in humans as well, there are many aesthetic forms which can't be explained by natural selection. For example, a peacock's tail, to explain this from the evolutionary point of view, doesn't suffice to have the theory of natural selection, in other words, of the survival of the fittest because of some outside force, because the peacock's tail doesn't make the male more apt or fit for, to reproduce to be a male peacock, to means to have a advertisement, a billboard that can open up calling attention, but it, it can't fly, it's too heavy, it's too heavy to fly, it's difficult to deal with, but Darwin understand that all these designs, which are extremely complex, to be explained from the point of view of evolution, need to have been chosen by someone who chose always the most beautiful and most complex design. This person was, or the figure was the female or woman of the species. And the cri selection criterion is aesthetic. What does that mean? That in reality, this is neither Darwin nor Plum that says, but it's a consequence that we can arrive at, which is that peacocks or the peacock species is a kind of performance, aesthetic performance, in which the male is a dancer who does the performance, and the female is the curator, curator of the performance. So the species is an event, and it, we could reflect in the same way on the relationship between flowers and bees. Many of the reasons by which the species evolved are aesthetic reasons. They're aesthetic judgments done either by individuals of the same species or individuals from other species or even other kingdoms, which means that even a flowering garden is like a biennial exhibit of multiple species of an art exhibit, a non-human one, where the bees are the curators they decided who is going to marry whom or mate with whom amongst the flowers. And that is why it's normal that it be like this, because otherwise it's like humans have turned everything into art in the world. Art is the most, most widely disseminated thing in nature. And we practice art in our way. And the biggest problems that you define with art is what's left outside. It's what is not always an issue, a looping question. In a sense, the bees resolve and solve this in their way, which is very clever, intelligent. And Adriana Andrea was commenting here to me that your studio is going to be close to the house where Janira lived. And how does this play out for you? you have a relationship to Janira's work that 
some experience with this story. Jen Nieder, the painter. I have a strong relationship with her work. And I had this thing of her house, which was she left the house in Parachi, and the house is there. And I think that the house needs life. It needs the studio is going to be close to it. And the house is uh, practically in ruins already, but it's a place that has a lot of energy where she painted. There are people that live in this place who appear in her uh, paintings when they were still children. And they're now old, in their old age, and they still live. There. There's this interesting thing that you can see the palm trees that she painted, which are, are bigger now. It's true that this uh, the, have the uh, ferns invaded. It's totally been invaded by fern species. Ferns, this house in ruins by the Janita the painting here in Brazil. There's this thing and cracks any attempt at keeping plants out. Uh, they always fail miserably. The plants uh, encroach into the cracks and crannies. Their desire to live this overwhelming desire to continue to live, living, continue living. Sorry, the will to live. I would like for Emanuele to talk a little bit about the relationship, the idea of Schopenhauer, of the nature's desire or will in your thinking. Yes, I believe that the desire, let's begin with the fact that there is nothing more mysterious in living beings and human beings than the desire, at least in my, to understand what I want, what I desire is very complicated always, first of all, and to understand what others want is impossible. And I believe that this is the universal condition. In other words, in addition to living, and that also we know that at the end of the day, the person can even want to die as well. Of course, this in broad strokes, but the desire, the death wish in Freud exists, but every living being has this. There's a beautiful, phrase and written by or this quote by Mac Dian, a British artist, very good one, who works often with issues connected to living beings. He said, nature never knows what is best for it. And this is a way of saying that nature doesn't know quite well what it wants. This appears to be exactly the state basic state of all living beings. And at the end of the day, each living being aspires to something different without knowing well what it is, without knowing ahead of time what. That's why living is so difficult. And if we launch into one direction, the species do that, they launch into a direction, an evolutionary direction, which leads to death. We, for example, we are clearly launching into our own death as a species. But the important thing is to avoid thinking in humans as unique who have some kind of cosmic rationality. And it's important also to avoid thinking that the other species are incapable of erring that there is always have a perfect desire. No, life by definition is this openness to the unpredictable, the possible, and also the possibility of desiring ill and making mistakes, you wish poorly, or to not have the slightest idea what one wants and that what makes, that's what make life so beautiful for everyone. So there's no, there are many, desires and a lot of confusion, of course. So there's not just one desire. Desire and confusion are two important deaths. It's the death of desire. Desire and confusion, the metaphysics of metaphysics of mixture, as in your book, 
the life of plants and metaphysics of mixture. We have just five minutes left. They just told me from the production crew. We have five minutes. It's going to be taped. The song from Adriana. And while Adriana gets her guitar, I'm going to begin to say farewell to the penultimate roundtable in this year's flip. It's an exhausting day. It's a day that people are saying farewell to the festival. I'm very grateful and happy and honored to be able to lead this roundtable. Thank you very much to one and all. And we'll continue with the final acknowledgments of this by Emanuele Cocha. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Adriana. Thank you, Cecilia. Thank you, Hermano. Thank you, Anna, for the invitation. Uh, thank you indeed, very much. Thank you, people, Flip, everyone who's attending. And Emmanuel, it's a huge pleasure to meet you and talk with you. Thank you, Flip, for this opportunity to talk to with uh, Emmanuel Coach and let's have a song. Amazon in the middle, in the middle, in the middle of midday, in the photography of the sunlight, the sun rays, the storm and flood. The Amazon, so many colors in the same name, green, so many people in the same hunger and thirst, the universe of all inspiration. I'm going to search. I searched. I, I, fell, I found El Dorado, Amazon. They're warriors of a women's tribe and a underwater civilization. Give me more immenseness. The Amazon in the middle, in the middle, in the middle of midday, in the sun ray and photographic light, but fires, floods, and storms. The Amazon, so many colors, the same name green so many people with the same hunger and thirst a universe of total inspiration did i search i did search i and i found el dorado the Amazon, the warriors of a women's tribe from an underwater civilization, uh, give me more immenseness. Oh, yes. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you, Emanuele. Thank you, Flip, everyone.